Well, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Tony Hughes, and welcome to the CEO Sales Insights Show. Uh, super excited about the show today. We've got an amazing guest, uh, Cal Sice, who's the general manager, leader, running uh, the Arrow uh, business, an amazing technology company in uh, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and we're going to you in LinkedIn Live, so please feel free to type your questions into the comments field. We can't interact with you uh, in two directions, but we can see your questions, and I'll try to get to those to actually ask Carl. Uh, the purpose of the Sales Insights, uh, the CEO Sales Insights show, is for leaders of businesses to hear some ideas and benefit from the real world experience of others in how to sustainably drive revenue growth. And if you're a salesperson or a sales leader, uh, Carl and I are also going to be talking about uh, how do you gain access into the C-suite? What's the best way to actually access the leader of a business? The show is brought to you by Sales IQ Global. Uh, we are the market leaders uh, in bringing together the best methodologies with a way of getting the information into people at scale, large global teams, uh, through an incredible e-learning platform. And then the third most important element, the coaching and accountability to really move the needle on performance. So Sales IQ Global can help you drive improved results, especially around sales pipeline and sales effectiveness to help sellers be the best they can be. And I'd really also like to thank our sponsor for today, which is Trigger. Uh, that's T-R-I-G-G-R dot A-I. Uh, they're the sales intelligence platform that turns the internet itself into your opportunity funnel uh, for helping you understand the attributes of your ideal customer profile. And then the trigger events that go on that give you context for running outreach to where you're most likely to drive the strongest results. Uh, so uh, I'll bring Carl in in a moment, but just to give you a little bit of his background, I've actually known Carl, believe it or not, for three decades. Uh, we both met when we were sellers, and each of us have had a path into becoming uh, the CEO of a business leading organizations in the Asia Pacific region through sales initially. So it's a great career path for anybody in sales watching this. Uh, he's a true sales professional. He's worked in every part of the IT supply chain. Uh, he's led teams at large organizations, uh, including a brand we'd all know, um, Staples, Acronis, um, Gartner, Sun Microsystems, um, Alcatel-Lucent. He was the leader at Alcatel-Lucent uh, in this region. Um, he's incredibly strong at driving sales transformation and leading teams. Uh, he's passionate about developing the next generation of people that will actually succeed him. Uh, and like me, he's been a guest lecturer or is a guest lecturer within the MBA program at the University of Technology, Sydney, uh, and the Macquarie Graduate School of Management, uh, MGSM, has an incredible reputation. Um, he's also um, been uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame uh, by Australian Reseller News. Um, he's on the board and in the chapter uh, of CompTIA as well, an amazing IT association. So without any further ado, I'll actually bring Carl into the conversation and Carl, thanks for joining us. I know we had some tech issues this morning that you've managed to overcome. So, mate, thank you for joining us. Great to be here, Tony. Thank you so much for the opportunity and good morning, everyone. Hey, Carl, just to maybe kick things off, uh, just to give people context of what you're going to share, would you mind providing a brief uh, overview of Arrow and Arrow's go-to-market strategy? Absolutely, Tony. So Arrow is a $600 million company in Australia we currently transact through approximately 1,100 transacting business partners. So for those who are not familiar with the IT industry, there are three levels of the IT industry. There are the vendors, there are the distributors, and there are the business partners. And of course, then there's the customers. Our role is to act as the distributor. So we aggregate the technology. We act as the incoming for a variety of tangible and intangible vendors. And we provide service to well over 300 uh, partners across the network. We also have a large global footprint. So our business is based in Denver, Colorado in North America, and we have an extensive business in North America and across Europe as well. What makes us different to other distributors of our kind is really two things. Our go-to-market alignment is all about the growth workloads. So we are not a volume distributor that does many things to many people. We do a few things in a few areas with a few workloads. 
And we do that in a way where we carefully manage the vendor customer relationships that we have. So from a GTM perspective, we have deep technical skills and we have also IP developed, but it's relevant to those key workloads. And we try and take that to our channel ecosystem and provide value and provide innovation. And the crude term to use, Tony, is we're a bit of a mix master of the industry. Awesome, awesome. And um, I'm just noting some comments coming in. Um, Eric Downey, thank you so much for sharing that you've uh, just started reading reading the book, Tech Powered Sales Over My Shoulder. I uh, hope you're really enjoying the book. Um, hey, Carl, uh, just share with people your career path through to leadership. You know, so, so how did you progress up in an organization and what's your tips for salespeople that aspire to actually lead a business one day? Thanks, Tony. So I, I started in uh, business development, which at the time, I'm scared to tell you the years. You've, you've already identified my age earlier. I won't do it twice. But, you know, one, one of the great things about the industry in the noughties particularly was that it was highly innovative, highly agile and highly mobile. And in terms of my, and my opportunity started in a business partner landscape. I worked in a reseller. At the time, it was called Applied Microsystems. It became Volante and something else after that. And essentially, I was there for five and a half years. My role was to serve corporate customers. So I focused on the financial services uh, sector and also the manufacturing sector and took solutions to market. We had a managed services and a managed consulting business that were able to provide outcomes. And at that stage in the IT industry, there was a lot of new tech coming into play, but a lot of organizations didn't know how to deploy or how to take advantage. And the great thing about being in a business partner landscape is you were the person amongst a team of others who were basically providing those solutions and providing those means because technology is not about the tech. It's not about the features or the benefits. It's about the business outcome that's being generated. So even back then, it was about looking at what the improvements are. It might be a cost saving, it might be a process improvement, or it might be a service level improvement. Whichever of those three things it is, my role at the time was to focus on a bunch of people around me to deliver those values. What I've done since that time, Tony, is traversed across different parts of IT. Some call me a chameleon. I take that as a compliment. Um, I've always tried to operate in different in the different theatres of IT. As I've said before, for those who don't understand tech, we operate at a vendor level, distributor level, and, and a business partner level. And I'm, I'm having arrived in Arrow now just on a year ago, completes my journey. This is the first distributor I've worked for. And it's great to be part of this because I'm getting a, I'm getting a perspective on the industry that I think is quite unique. And I haven't gone up a single channel a single particular channel or stayed in, you know, back in the day when I was at Dell, I was at Dell for seven and a half years. I didn't go across to IBM or to HB. Love those guys, but it wasn't about that. My job was to take what I had, build on it and bring perspective. So even coming into this particular opportunity, I think the one thing that really sets what I do apart and, and some of the team that I'm now, now leading is that we think differently about those relationships. We don't call vendors vendors, we call them customers. We want to focus on the commerciality. We want to make sure we're rigorous and we're accountable in our relationships to them. And I'd like to think that's relatively unique. Not everyone's able to do that, particularly when you're doing high volumes of work. It's really easy to lose your head and get caught up in the industry and some of the jargon and some of the ways in which people operate. And you won't necessarily be effective. My big thing, Tony, is I've always been a risk taker. Now, risk doesn't mean foolish. Risk means calculating where, where the right moves are. When I came to Arrow, I wasn't expecting to come to Arrow. Um, someone needed help to transform, form. Someone needed help to fix up. And I am a bit of a renovator. I love going into businesses like this, which have got amazing bones. And Arrow has been amazingly successful prior to my arrival. My role is to bring something else to the table. And I feel that the team I'm now part of is reimagining the basis of what we can be and it's really cool to be here. It's really exciting to be part of the journey. And I'm, I see myself here for many years more. Cal, there's been a lot of changes in the world in the last few years. Um, everything that went on with COVID has created a, a digital first world. Sellers have had to figure out uh, how do we build relationships of trust and meaningful engagement with people, despite having to do a lot of remote selling. Um, wh where do you see the big challenges and, and risks and the inflection points for successfully executing profitable growth in a business? I think it's incredibly important to understand that what used to be valuable some time back, what not only won't be valuable today, but it won't be valuable tomorrow. People have been forced to reimagine their entire models. I mean, look at the look at the real estate, commercial real estate market. 
I know we've got a couple of premises which we're moving in some of our locations around Australia, we're moving premises. And even the basis of conversation that you're having with people in that industry has completely changed. I think every, every industry and everyone operating in the theatre of business has to think about the challenges differently. And I think it's, it's actually really healthy, Tony. I think COVID, there's a lot I didn't like about COVID. I'm a social person and I don't like to be told to stay still. So, you know, that part of COVID wasn't fun. But what I loved about COVID, you and I both have worked in the tech industry and we've, all, we've always worked um, quite virtually and we've always made um, the, the, we haven't made our environment about being in any particular place, particularly the office. So to actually mobilise and think differently about some of the business problems we have and also find new ways to go to market, I think there's probably been an acceleration of, of the transformation um, and the and the momentum. And, and for me, that's very exciting. I think that's a very healthy place to be. And I'm looking forward from that. Carl, that's really good advice for everybody. Um, let's move on to one of the probably um, <laughs> toughest parts of being a leader, especially as you report up into region or if you're a CEO watching this and you've got a board that you report to, the issue of forecasting. Um, you know, forecasting, I, I remember saying to people last week in a session I was running that, um, you know, as a leader, we can often feel like we age a whole year of our life, you know, every quarter um, in trying to make sure we hit the number. The super senior people in organisations don't care about hardly anything else other than the number. You just have to find a way. So what's your advice to leaders and for sellers as you're listening to this? You know, this will give you an insight into the, the life of a leader. What are your tips and your approach for driving risk out of forecasting? Yeah, look, I, I wish I could tell you, Tony, that that problem has gone away in all these years of my service and it continues to challenge me and my team every day. I work for Arrow as a public company. It's publicly listed on the New York Stock Exchange. That introduces a new dynamic when it comes to the, the, the forecasting and running the business. And the business does demand predictability. I know as I've spoken to our American uh, colleagues, our executive colleagues in the US, and my boss is based in Paris, he's looking for more and more improvement steps and more and more, pro more, and more understanding of the business. So we do get rid of what I'd call the logarithmic nature of our business. We need a linear business in order to have confidence so that the business can feel like it can invest. Arrow's got a rich heritage of making um, growth happen, not only in organic means, and particularly when you're looking at inorganic options, you can't do it in a backdrop of something that's not stable. So it's extremely critical, both as a leader and also as a business person selling into the, the environment we're talking about. My tips to people probably aren't that fantastic. It's, it's about knowing understanding your environment and de-risking your environment by bringing enough people to the table. I know in the times you and I worked together, we often did three-legged activity all the time in aligning our business and making sure our plans were mutually aligned and we had an appropriate cadence and a very simple breakdown of exactly what, who, where, what, why, how, and understanding and breaking down and whether it's banned or other means you need to understand those different risk factors and take steps against them. Um, I also think it's really important uh, for sales not to be just about the salespeople. One of the things I've really focused on, I'm incredibly proud of my vendor and marketing team because one of the things we do, which is great and it, and it works well, is the numbers not just owned by the sales team. It's actually owned by a vendor and business management team. And that means that there's a mutuality there. There's a There's a probably even a three-dimensional, and I'm, I'm omitting to say our sales engineering group as well. There are There is three three different parts of our business looking at the same problem, thinking about it slightly differently and coming together in a way that for everyone involved, it removes the the element of uh, of risk and, 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 and complacency. So I don't know if any of that helped, Tony. It, it continues to be a big challenge. I know you have some great disciplines. You talk to some of those disciplines in some of the books that you publish and some of the work that you do. And I think you're probably a better place than me to speak to this stuff, but I think it, it's never been more important. I think the world's looking for looking for something to believe in, and 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 when it comes to the the area we're talking about, the results that's incredibly important and always will be. Carl, I agree with you 100. Uh, you know, the key as a leader is to drive business predictability, and bad news early is usually something that we yeah. can do something about, <laughs> but bad news late is a real problem. I was talking. 
with a CEO last week and he said to me that uh, one of the things that drives him crazy is uh, his salespeople will bring him into a deal right at the end because they feel the deal's in trouble. Mm. And you know what he said to me, and he's, and he's dead right, is if you bring me in at the end, my ability to influence you know, is relatively low. And I feel like I'm there doing a loss review most of the time, is what he said to me. You know, the ability yeah. to do brand just isn't there. So early engagement is really key. And Carl, what you said is 100% true. Once we've managed to break through and create some meaningful engagement, and we're now, now in the progression phase of working with the customer or the partner, then it's all about managing risk. So I think all of your comments about it's a, it's a risk management game is dead true. Uh, the very first CEO Sales Insight show we did was with Simon Tate, who's the CEO uh, for all of uh, Asia Pacific and Japan for Adobe. Uh, about right. 5,000 people, I think, reporting up to him. But he's created his own risk management framework, right? But but his view is, you know, every deal we should be thinking about, how do I take risk off? How do I take risk off? So, hey, that's great. Look, we'll just move in a moment to, to some tips for salespeople, but just maybe to round out this piece around... Uh, good advice and insights for leaders. H how would you describe the the culture that you create in a business to make it c customer and and sales centric? Um, and 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 then just following that, if you want to follow on with it, what are the qualities that you look for in people? So first part of your question, that's a great question, Tony. So first and foremost, how, how do we build the culture, and how do we how do we how do we create a culture that that thinks sales first, second, and third? I think it comes down to sales, a point I tried to make earlier, sales is not about any one of us. It's about working across function and creating a, an environment where first and foremost, as the leader of the business, I'm acutely aware that because of the title I occupy, it's not because I'm any different to anyone else, there's a, there's a gap, there can be a, a perceived gap from people in the business. My job, it's my job, not theirs, it's my job to get rid of that gap. It's my job to get rid of the the, the reasons people can't come to the table and use me. And I was in Brisbane last week. I've got an amazing bunch of people in near the Fortitude Valley in Brisbane who do an amazing job, but they do an amazing job. And I'm able to come in there and provide my value because they open the door. As a leader, one of the biggest things you've got to do is unlock those unlock those um, barriers and, and and allow people to, to, to trust you and feel like they can actually reach in and use you and identify value. I often use the terms, I know I'm planning at the moment to go over to Perth very soon. And I said to my team over there, I said, please don't take me to any kiss the baby or shake hands meetings. You know, and I apologize for the crude way I'm saying this, but I, I, you know, I've got an amazing team over there as well. But the idea is I'm there to add value and, and, and every one of us have got a responsibility. I also encourage Tony, and I know this is a bit old fashioned. I also encourage those who are not in commercial roles. So I've got a absolutely fantastic back office team, technology operations and finance. When I speak to that team, they're always customer minded. I encourage them to actually connect into our world. So they have their own relationships and they drive those relationships. It's not just because Carl's asking or it's a tra it's a transactional need. They connect, they collaborate and they create. And when you start doing that as an organization, if it starts becoming an orchestrated outcome rather than any one of us, magic happens. And I think my, my advice to salespeople in that environment is you know, my success, and I, I've been very, very lucky. I've had a lot of lot of opportunities come my way because I've got some I've had some amazing connections over the years. But the number one thing is I've constantly sought to grow and develop the environments that I'm in. I never have tried to take for granted. Even at Dell, I was at Dell for seven and a half years. I was at Staples for six and a half years. I felt like every single quarter was innovative. Every single year involved change. And that change wasn't because the business was banging on my door. It was because I, I was putting pressure on myself to keep up, to make sure that I was not only keeping up with the market, but giving my team and those stakeholders who work with me the value that they deserved. And I think that's that's it's an attitude thing. You asked me about what I look for in people, Tony. I'll be really honest. Everyone can put a good CV together. Um, in fact, there's companies that you can go pay and they'll do it for you. The, the, key, the key is... To, to, to have a personal brand of authenticity, of passion and, 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 and differentiation and be someone who, who people can use as a tool. I mean, Arrow brought me into this business for a particular reason. 
the role that I occupy, I'm the first guy in this business that didn't do distribution previously. Why did they do that? Because I brought a different something to the table. I was able to articulate that to the then decision makers in a way that they had confidence that we were going to think about these business problems differently. Everyone can have that attitude. Everyone can take that attitude to their every day and get value from it. And ultimately the people they work with will, 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 will rally in and lean in and everyone benefits from that. I hope that makes sense. Wow, Carl, so many incredible insights there. And, and I really agree with you. We, we need to be the change ourselves that we wanna see in our own environment rather than complain. Um, I really believe that for most leaders, the most powerful diagnostic tool that we can use in any business is actually a mirror. <laughs> you know, uh, we need to be able to look ourselves in the eye uh, and absolutely know that we are doing what it takes to be able to deserve the results that we seek, that we've done everything we can to set people up for success, you know, before we get our blowtorch out on people. Mm. But Carl, I really agree with you um, in the same way that for, for salespeople, and for sales managers to, to drive forecast accuracy, it's all about taking risk off, you know, in every area that we can with the deal. In managing sales teams, the thing I found, it's all about just reaching in and removing one excuse after the other until all that's left is accountability, right? So we just want to keep removing the roadblocks and, pro roadblocks and problems until all that's left is accountability. So uh, I, I absolutely agree, agree with all of that. And, um, you know, it's tough to hire salespeople. They're sellers, right? They're great at projecting the wonderful facade, you know, but the truth is we're looking for people with, well, with lots of lots of traits, right? But but really strong work ethic, um, high EQ, uh, genuinely curious about the other person, driven by really positive values, not, af not, not afraid of rejection, <laughs> right? So any, anyone who's this amiable personality people pleaser and just, you know, is unable to put tension into a conversation or or hear mm. bad news or deliver bad news is never going to make it uh, in sales to the level that they need to. So really, really great advice, Carl. Hey, let, let's change gears and try and help the salespeople that are watching this today. So um, what I always do with every leader I have on the show is I just ask them some questions about what it would take to get to them. So uh, for a seller, watch previous episodes of the CEO Sales Insight Show uh, and maybe go to about halfway through the show and you get this part of the conversation. So, so a few questions. Um, and I want to kick off with something sort of provocative. It's a hobby horse of mine. I just want to ask you a question. On average in a week, how many phone calls do you get from salespeople versus how much email or in-mail in LinkedIn are you receiving? So the answer would be less than less than 20 phone calls. And 20 is um, still a lot. Wow. Less less than 20 phone calls and probably, I would say, <laughs> oh, dare I say, two or 300 LinkedIn, you know, of, of, of the other. Um, and, and I need to qualify that answer, Tony, by saying that I'm not talking about qualified LinkedIn notes. I'm talking about lots and lots of white noise, lots and lots of, hi, Tony, I'm here to help your day get better, or hi, Tony, give me some time so I can get to know you better. I think you get the idea. So I get, uh, sadly, I get lots and lots of those. <laughs> uh, Carl, I, I, can't, I can't tell you the inane messaging that I receive in LinkedIn. Hey, Tony, I noticed we're both based in Sydney. Does it make sense to chat? You know, I don't think so. There's five and a half million other people, you know, um, or people just start asking inane questions. So, um, okay, so talk to us about what approaches work. So if someone wanted mm. to get you, let me ask you a few things. What's the best time of day? If someone if someone wanted to get back on the phone, and we should all get back on the phone, by the way, if yep. someone phoned you, what's the best time of day where you're likely to pick up and have the conversation? Um, 8.23 a.m. This this is a good time. So before before business hours, sometimes in the middle of the day and sometimes at the end of the day. Even, even for someone who comes into a conversation with me and has real value to give, and that's the important part of the message, yeah. those who do get through have either identified a compelling event, they might have noticed that Arrow has announced, I'll give you an example, we announced two brand new partnerships last month, and that started a flurry of activity. And frankly, that's okay. That's okay. People t pinging us saying, congratulations on working with Megaport and Hitachi, well done. Uh, we we currently do work in this area, this area, and we help them to. That, that, those are relevant conversations for me to have, particularly when people tie it back to the actual pain that I'm feeling or, or potential pain that I'm feeling. 
what what doesn't work and 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 what does work there is people that understand that they need to qualify their their they need to ring the doorbell they need to ring the doorbell by saying carl i think i can help you what's a good time of day that works for you and how might i be able to um how might i be able to assist you and they make it very short sharp and snappy it's not about writing narratives that are that are this long it's about getting to the point very quickly in the first couple of lines because all of us are time poor all of us are challenged with um with with other distractions during each and every day the idea is to prioritize um the most important messages and tie it back to that compelling event wow there's there's so much there carl i'd just like to unpack some of this so so some of the things I'm hearing is the best time to reach you is before or after normal office hours or in the middle of the day when you're having a break, not not when you're buried in meetings and I've got all of your staff wanting your time and things booked anyway. Um, obviously, we're based in Australia as we talk now. So every every country and region tends to be a little different in, in work habits. But when would it be too early, <laughs> right? Like would would... Would 7 a.m. be too early? Like, when do you think it's okay for that phone to start ringing? I think plus or minus 10% of the business day. So if it's 8 o'clock, if we're saying 8 o'clock is okay, I'd be careful about someone, I'd be careful calling someone at 7.30 unless I knew them and had a, had already a, a basis of a conversation. And equally, at the end of the day, it, you know, calling at 8.30 at night probably isn't, isn't <laughs> going to be a great thing for most people. Whereas calling at 5.30 or calling even at 5.45 and saying, hey, got a minute, I think I've got something you, you'll be able to use. Or, Carl, I know you're doing a, doing some work with Atashi or Megaport. We've got some amazing this, this, and this. Those those conversations probably relate more easily and tend to get more listen. Okay. And, I, and Carl, I agree. The thing I say to people is uh, if you're calling a white-collar executive, if you're calling someone in a trades industry, they obviously start you know, crazy early, but in a white-collar profession, uh, quarter to eight in the morning through to about 10 to nine is probably mm. a golden period of highest probability. Uh, and then what I find is people tend to not be booking meetings after after five o'clock, but they're cleaning up their day and still working. Um, and if, if they're not working, they're traveling. A lot of people with young families will want to get home maybe for 6 or 6.30 p.m. for dinner. So I think it's okay to be calling uh, up until about 10 to 6.00. Now I want I want to ask you, Carl, whether you agree with this for email. So that's the phone, right? We don't we shouldn't be for calling after six p.m. in a market like this or before, say, quarter to eight. But those shoulders of the day are great, and if people are in the car traveling or on public transport, you know they're they're happy. They're happy to deal with things. Absolutely. With emails, here's what I find: um, I'll often maybe be sitting on my lounge watching some TV, and I've got the phone beside me. If an email pops in. My, my phone will just light up, letting me know that something's down. I glance down and look at it. So I think emails in the evening are really effective. Do you find the same thing? I agree. People are less hurried and less less um, under pressure on the immediate here and now. And, and if it's of value, and again, it all goes back to the same answer, Tony. It's got to be of genuine value. It can't be of value to the person sending. It's got to be of value to the person receiving. When people start talking in Carl Seiss language, you're going to start. You're going to start getting a listen. Um, all too often, and, and we're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it as well. We'll put our own branding over the top of everything, and feel like that's compelling enough to open the door. That's not going to get it done. You've got to absolutely um, lock it in at a, at a, at a very, um, very receiver level uh, in, information, and make sure you stick that. Make sure you stick that. Yeah, I'm. I'm absolutely with you 100. percent So we we need to talk the language of leaders. And we need to turn up with a point of view. If someone wanted to call you, Carl, I'm sure you'd lean into the conversation if they said, hey, Carl, I think there could be some ways for you too, <laughs> right? And if it's, you know, drive drive improved revenue growth with this particular category in the business yep. or uh, um, get more of your reps on target or de-risk the, the pipeline with stronger coverage, <laughs> yep. right? Or, yep. or, or be able to acquire um, new brands, right, that'll have a, a big impact on revenue, you go, oh, well, how do you think I could do that? It creates the conversation. So mm. I'm with you 100% about talking the language of leaders. We've talked about time of day. We've talked about you must have the right message. Um, what about day of week? Are, are there days, so if we look at sellers thinking, when's the best, well, so where are the best uh, places in my calendar in a week to slot in these time blocks 
So we've got shoulders of the day and maybe lunchtime. What about days of week? This might be an IT answer, Tony. So forgive me if I'm, I'm I'm being a little bit myopic about my answer. But I think in the IT industry, most of the roles I've occupied, Mondays have been very, very crazy. Uh, we do yes. cadence reviews. We do regional reviews. I've got a one-on-one -on -one with my boss. Um, there's all sorts of stuff. And we're normally doing um, critical, ch critical deal checks. We're doing everything that keeps me completely focused. Whereas a Tuesday starts to get starts to get into the out external view of the week so that that tends to be a good day um end of the week we tend to be wrapping up I, i'd be cautious of anyone calling in at 5 30 on a friday night in australia i think in the culture we have regardless of people's plans it's a it's a period where people are starting to either you know check out or check to, or warm down and they're working on you know how to wrap up their week but you know those early days with probably the exception of monday so i think tuesday is a great day particularly if you're using that strategy that you're promoting, which is thinking of the shoulders of the day, I think that's a very effective um, approach, particularly when you've got something to say. Cal, I agree with you 100%. My, my entire career as a business leader, Mondays has always been meetings mayhem, you know, all day long. And I, the, the reason I think you and I do that, and most leaders do that, is so that Tuesday to Thursday is available to to get out of the office, travel around the country in region, maybe go up to Singapore, you know, all of that travel we need to do. Yep. And none of us want to be flying back into our home city on the last day of the week. It's chaos at airports, right? So what I That's found right. is, That's right. is it's really difficult to get hold of someone on a Monday typically. A Friday afternoon is a great time because they usually don't book meetings and they're cleaning up their week and planning for next week. Yep. And while people are traveling, they're usually happy to take calls as well, you know, because they're typically on the fly. Hey, hey, Nicholas, I might just jump to your question. Thanks for asking it. So, Carl, there's a question here in the comments part of the platform, but I'll just read it out to you. Um, and it's from Nicholas Lambro, who I've worked with in the past. He's a great guy. Um, how do you balance the expectations of your board or the leadership team above you with the real world pressures of um, finding and retaining the right sales team, right? Who can actually deliver on the results that are needed to get rid of all of that pressure. So, so how do you manage the expectations yeah. above with the yeah. reality of getting and retaining great people? Thanks, for, thanks for the question, Nick. Um, I think it's one of the challenges that it's perpetual, and I think one of the most important things any leader needs to do in a role. I've been now in the role for a year, so I'd like to think I know the stakeholders. A little bit better but when it when it comes to how to address the stakeholders i'm a big believer that there's no one answer i have different executives who have different needs and look at the business with different lenses the idea is to understand that and not force feed my own values and force feed my own um, data just because it looks good for me one of the one of the things my boss is a very um very busy guy he's got a six and a half billion dollar business in europe he runs he's not interested in you know, 15 pages of slides that tell tell him how fantastic ANZ is. What he's interested is in on a page, give me the summary, what's happening with the people, what's happening with the processes, what's happening with the performance, what's happening with the progress, where are the challenges, and let's get out of here. Um, obviously, we have some financial reviews. I just did a QBR last week with our global team. There were 15 executives in the room in Denver, including my boss. Luckily, it was a friendly meeting, but some of those meetings become quite adversarial if the interests of the people that I'm talking about aren't met. Those people in the room, we had the CFO globally, we had the global president, we had a number of different people around the table. Each were looking at the um, the state of the business and the belief that the confidence that they have not only in me, but in the business that I'm part of in being able to achieve the medium and long-term and the short-term needs. And so it's a, it's a tricky thing, Tony. You've got to balance those different things. But most of all, you've got to start with knowing who you're pitching to and knowing what their needs are rather than what yours are. Hey, hey Nick, it's a great question. And uh, the thing that's critically important is that the people above us, whether that's the board or the person we report to in the USA, it's important that they never lose confidence, right? So they have to have confidence in what we're telling them. And what Carl says is so true, you know, putting together these 17 slide decks, just send people to sleep. A really good friend of mine um, was CEO for a massive global organization. He'd been in Canada for, in essence, a QBR. You know, he was in Canada every quarter. He was waiting at the airport in San Francisco on his way back to Australia. He got told to turn around and go back to Canada. Michael Dell was on the board of this company, and he wanted to meet with the three 
global regional leaders. So my my friend Mike ran all of Asia Pacific Japan. So the head of EMEA, uh, you know, was there, and also the head of the Americas was there. And uh, Mike was the third to present. Luckily, the other two global leaders are presenting, and Michael Dell is just lo looking more and more bored, and then more and more frustrated as they went through. Is what Mike mm. shared with me. And my, and uh, and Michael Dell said, "Look, can you just get to the numbers slide? Like, I just want to see the numbers slide. If I want any of this other information, I'll ask. Can we start with the numbers slide? <laughs> and that's exactly what Mike did when it was his turn. But yeah, all people care about is the numbers. So, so Nick, you know, yeah, you, um, yeah. You know something. You know something you said earlier, which relates to this point, Tony. You said it earlier in today's conversation. Bad news doesn't get better. <laughs> uh, if you've got bad news to share." It's it's actually the best time to share it is the is the is the immediate time and it's the early, earliest time. Early, if, uh, yeah, if you're if you're perceived as the leader, where it's all sunshine and light, right up until nearly the end of the quarter or the financial year, and then there's these disappointing surprises. People will lose confidence in you. So managing expectations is key. Nick, the other thing I'd say as well is make sure that you're data driven in how you present this but make sure people in the business above you understand and accept and acknowledge the ramp time involved and the need for overlay. You know, mm. uh, not every rep is going to make their numbers as you hire people, as you move others on and bring people in, there's ramp periods. Uh, so make sure the number that you carry as the leader allows for that. And what I find is typically the leader should be carrying 80% of the sum of all of the targets of the people under them. Uh, it should never be one to one. Is is really my advice. So, hey, um, Carl, just really quickly, because I want to ask you uh, uh, my last question. I'll ask everybody in a moment, and we'll wrap up shortly. But are you happy to give some examples of the best and worst uh, times that sellers have tried to create some engagement with you as a leader? Yeah, happy to, Tony. The best times uh, really are about people understanding enough about my business or enough about the business that I'm involved in to be able to bring specific value to it. So several times people have said to me in my homework, I know I've had some fantastic interviews where, where people have come in, they've been pitching a particular um, idea for our business. And they've said, actually, we've done some homework. So to save you some time, here's some evidence that you'll be able to use, which relates directly to what you're doing today. And I took these numbers, you're a public company, I know you trade, we know what the numbers are. I've already done the modeling, so you don't have to. And they'll come in with a with already a, a fairly strong working solution in their mind. And I know that I know that's risky because if you don't get it right, it, the conversation can go off quite quickly. But more often than not, the fact that, that, that people have actually taken that time and have actually put in the energy and the effort and have brought an outcome to the table is priceless. And in a leadership role, when you're constantly time poor, people who save you time but also create value uh, on your terms is 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 a, is a very very valuable asset. As far as bad examples, I don't know that we have the time, Tony. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> there, are, there are plenty. I mean, we've spoken about some of them earlier already, but it comes down to people just simply, you know, not not thinking properly, and coming to the table with a very blind. I want to get fifteen minutes to talk to you about your business. It's like no, everything you need is on the web, um, and I'm not rude. I I I. I you know, for many years, and, and this is my upbringing, my parents' upbringing, I, I come from a, a European post-war family. So, you know, my upbringing is I return all calls. I actually do re reply to every single LinkedIn, even when it's a no. Um, and that's a dangerous trait to have because you, you, you get a lot of uh, pings. But what people are doing is wasting their time and yours. They're coming to the table with, hey, I'm going to shoot, cast the net out. I'm going to catch I'm going to ca catch 100 contacts. And don't worry, Tony Hughes taught me that I can get 20 of those that are going to return my call. That's not true at all. That's not true at all. It's a it's a total waste of time in 2022 to not use technology for what it was. LinkedIn is and continues to be a very powerful tool. Uh, however, it's, it's also got a lot of white noise. And unfortunately, the people who've chosen to spam uh, me or spam others in my type of role are doing nothing but wasting their time and that, that of our company. So, you know... Sadly, sadly, I see too many examples of that still, Tony. Um, yeah, it's it's an absolute um, heartbreaking thing when you realise, you know, good people who have good intentions are, are not going to be able to go forward because they're, they're still practising things that aren't, aren't anywhere even close to good practice. 
I love that advice, Carl. So um, a great call is where they've done their research right right out mm. of the gate. They show you that they know you. They've done their research. They're brief and they get to the point. They've nar- they've nailed the narrative and it's about you. It's not about them. So I really like that. And obviously, and the bad calls are where the opposite of all of that is going on. So, so that's great advice for sellers. Okay. Hey, just as we wrap up, Carl, um, first of all, uh, is the best way for someone to connect with you in LinkedIn? Would you encourage them to connect with you on LinkedIn? If there's not a relationship today, definitely. Um, I, I, like I said, I do, I do um, respond to every LinkedIn. Sometimes it takes me a little bit of time, but there isn't a connection I don't make um, as long as it's legitimate. So I think, Again, different, there's different answers to your question, Tony. I'm happy to take um, approaches from the market directly. People are often saying, hey, I'm thinking about the future. I know Arrow is currently on the move. Um, would you consider having a discovery with me? And we might we might set aside 15 minutes to have a chat and just have a scratch around. And, and some of the best opportunities have come from those conversations. But right. we keep, we've said it a few times. You've got to make sure that there's genuine value and there's differentiation and you're actually coming to the table with some some real real perspective and real real possibilities, not just talk. Yeah, so connection request should always be contextualized. I agree, and uh, and people can feel free to connect with me in LinkedIn. I think I'm getting up on my my thirty thousand connection limit in LinkedIn. Ooh. I think they've still got that thirty thousand wow. limit. So, but you can if you can't connect, you can certainly still follow me. So, uh, f- feel free to do that. And Carl, want to want to want to wrap up today just with asking you this question. If you, because you've been incredibly successful in your career, and I've I've seen you go through your career, it's been incredible, Carl. If you could go back and meet with the twenty-five year old self, what what advice would you give yourself? It's a great question, Tony. There's probably probably three things. Number one, study harder. And I'm not talking about school here. I'm talking about I wish I'd done an MBA much earlier, not because of the ticket. I'm not after the certificate. I'm after the experiences. I'm after the network and I'm after the modeling. And although I'm capable of doing many of the things that the program teaches, my study only got to a certain level and I wish I hadn't gone further because you and I have both guest lectured at MGSM and at UTS. Um, Tony, I, I walk away from those guest lecturing experiences energized for probably the next five hours. The, the, the capability in that room is like a lifelong resource. And I wish I'd known at 25 years of age not just the academic elements, but that, that other, those other X factor elements. Number two for me would be take, take probably more risks. I, I felt earlier in my career, for whatever reason, um, when I started taking risks, like my first job at Volante in the industry, I actually went to my boss at the, the time and said, hey, I know you guys are getting together as a leadership group. I know I'm not on that group, but I think I can bring some value. Um, I've got some ideas and here they are. And he said, you know what, it's a weekend meeting. You're probably not going to like it. I said, no problem. If you're happy for me to sit at the back of the room and the rest became history to actually take chances more often. Um, and I feel like I've done that, but I feel like, you know, risk can, your fears can fill, your fears can fool you, Tony. So I think earlier in my career, I wish I had been able to address that uh, challenge a little more early and be more effective as a result. And then number three, would be also about giving back in, in the in the community. One of the greatest joys of my last 10 years has been actually seeing others um, achieve success, um, giving back into the charitable areas. I've, I've worked very closely with Vinnie's. I apologize for the free ad, but Vinnie's does a lot of work with our social services and I, I, I've done a lot of work personally with the homeless. Gee, I wish I'd done that at 25 because I think I would have been an even better person. I know in my own family, I have I have three members of my direct family and all three of them are service workers. Um, I love what they are. I love what my kids have become, but I wish I'd also, I, I now feel like I've got those uh, life skills and those understanding of the, the bigger world and, and how you actually can deliver great things to the world, not to business. And uh, for me, for me, that's been a great, great epiphany as well. So they're the three things, Tony. Thank you so much, Carl. And uh, Miles has just chimed in with a question. Um, can we give an example of how 25-year-olds can take more risks today? <laughs> have you got any thoughts on that, Carl? Well, I think the opportunity, COVID might have been a bit of a bit, bit of a um, bit of a governor in, in what I'm about to suggest, but I know that in today's world, the opportunity to travel is for business has never been greater. You can you can you can go across to Europe, you can go across to North America. Like the company I'm in, Arrow, we've got people in uh, living and working in Denver and experiencing other other outcomes. We've got people in 
Uh, we've got people in UK, we've got people across Europe, um, and both ways to actually take advantage of the global theatre that exists and actually get out there. I think, um, again, the, the risk, the, the, the mistake we all sometimes make is we get comfortable. And that's okay. That's human to be like that. But you've got to push yourself out there and and try things and, and actually go and do some discovery meetings with people and, and, you know, be strategic and go, okay, I'm sitting here at Arrow. I'm one year down the track. Where am I going to be in three years? And how do I map that? What steps can I take today? And there are answers to those questions. Trouble is yeah. sometimes we don't answer ask those questions soon enough. I love that. Hey, Miles, my, my input on this would be that uh, if you're 25, you can actually afford to make some mistakes. You, you typically don't have a big mm. mortgage yet in a family. Um, <laughs> so you're an age where you can make some mistakes. Uh, my son is 25. Uh, he's much smarter than I. Uh, got a double degree, uh, left uni, wasn't sure what he wanted to do. This is just a few years ago. And I said, look, why don't, if you don't know what, if you don't know what you want to do, why don't you take a role uh in sales it'll knock all of the edges off you it'll help you get out of your own way in life because <laughs> you you can't be successful in sales and have and have hang-ups and ego issues and everything else you've got to learn to talk to strangers and cope with rejection you've got you have to learn to battle big problems if you're a seller and he did and he became asia pacific employee of the year and the company was with he did selling for nearly two years and he decided it wasn't for him and that's great and now he's on the other side of the equation uh, working in procurement and he's been uh, promoted and doing really well. But the thing is, when you're young, you can afford to take some risks. So, you know, I, I would just say dream big, set some goals, be bold. You'll be amazed if you do what Carl did. He went to his boss, right? He was he was a rep. He wasn't a manager. He said, you know, in essence, I aspire to leadership. You know, can I sit at the back and watch? You know, I'd love to gain some insights into how the business operates. This is where I want my career to go. And they said, yes. Right. So he took the risk of asking and people thought, wow, this is the sort of person we're going to keep an eye on and promote. So, yeah. So, Carl, look, thank you so much for being on the show today. For everybody watching, obviously, connect with Carl and myself. Really encourage you to go to the Sales IQ Global, so salesiqglobal.com website. It's all designed to help you as a sales leader or as a salesperson be the very best that you can be. Uh, some incredible programs, especially around solving the number one problem that every business has, which is not enough consistent, healthy, quality sales pipeline. So, uh, so, so go and visit Sales IQ. Uh, my co-founder at Sales IQ, Lu Luigi Prestonenzi, incredible sales leader, has some amazing, amazing podcasts and resources there as well. Uh, if you'd like to find more out about me, uh, there's lots of free content that I've produced at tonyhughes.com.au, tonyhughes.com.au, uh, webinars, podcasts, videos, recordings. So, uh, Carl, just want to thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks, everybody, and we'll see you at the next CEO Sales Insight Show.